Last month, SkyTem Canada completed acquisition of approximately 21,000 line kilometers of airborne EM and magnetic data for Geoscience BC's uh, peace project. The objective of that project, as we've already seen in some talks this morning, was to gather new information, combine that with some existing information. And uh, Carlos and Andrea and the Geoscience BC organization, thank you very much for the opportunity to work with you on that peace project as well as to uh, speak with everyone today about airborne geophysics for, for mapping groundwater. A six-inch borehole represents less than one millionth of an acre. And sure, while that borehole, if done correctly, will tell us something about the geology beneath our feet, it's a leap of faith or an educated guess that uh, uh, to interpolate that geology, especially in quaternary uh, glaciated terrain, what, what we're going to find 10 metres, 100 metres a kilometre away. So if you've got a very large area, as we've seen with the Peace Project, 8,000 square kilometres, um, just how are you going to go about mapping that accurately? And airborne geophysics is certainly a way to, to do that. Um, we could certainly drill more boreholes, but how much time and money do we have? The area we're looking at here is just a quick example, but 28 square kilometers in Denmark. I mentioned Denmark. That's where SkyTem uh, was developed. It was developed by the Environmental Protection Agency in Denmark specifically to map groundwater. So we're looking here at exaggerated size boreholes. The colors represent uh, resistivity values. And like I say, how many bo what they were trying to accomplish here was characterization of a paleo channel at about 100 meters depth. Here we're looking at the airborne data. So it, there is close correlation with the airborne data and, and the boreholes. But more importantly, as we can see that paleo channel, over 28 square kilometers, uh, you see all the black dots, that's boreholes that were drilled in this area. So how much time and money did that take? Whereas we can see the airborne data, we can see the paleo channel, we could now perhaps drill fewer holes. I'm not going to say in this presentation that airborne geophysics replaces ground truth or boreholes, certainly not. We need that information. As a matter of fact, uh, when we're processing and interpreting <coughs> airborne geophysical data, it, it's good to have that borehole or any kind of a priori information that helps us with our depth calculations and just to calibrate the, the equipment. Also, airborne geophysics has been used for decades now in mineral exploration, oil and gas exploration, and in recent years, due to advancements in the technology, airborne geophysics uh, is being increasingly applied to geotechnical, environmental, and, uh, and hydrogeological studies. Uh, just quickly, I don't think I necessarily have to do that for, for most of you in this crowd, but just um, basics of airborne geophysics. We're looking at the SkyTem loop here. It's a time domain system. It measures approximately 25 by 35 meters. It flies uh, 30 meters above the Earth in parallel lines, depending on uh, what we're trying to accomplish and how much budget we have, 50 meters, 100 meters, 400 meter line spacings. Uh, typically for hydrogeological mapping, we fly at 100 meters. What we're doing is transmitting, there's copper coils in that loop, we're energizing them, transmitting a primary electromagnetic signal to the Earth, which creates eddy currents in anything conductive. It then creates a secondary electromagnetic signal, which we see back in the receiver. Earth elements, uh, soil, rock, water, have different resistivity, conductivity values. Uh, salt water at the bottom of the scale there is more conductive than fresh water. Fresh water is more conductive than frozen uh, permafrost or ice. Clays uh, filled with organic materials is more conductive than sand and gravel. Clays could be uh, an aquitard. Sand and gravels could be a recharge area or a paleo channel. But that's what we're mapping. And we take those values and we create a resistivity map something like this. Back in 2011, Geoscience BC was assessing the applicability of airborne geophysics to mapping groundwater. And uh, Geoscience BC and four partner companies, Imperial Oil being one of them, uh, got together in the Horn River Basin. Each company picked their own area, had their own particular uh, mandate that they wanted to. Uh, um, but um, so what I'm going to show you is the, uh, the Imperial Oil data. This is, we're looking at from the top down, an area of over 100 kilometers. And I'm going to start removing layers of earth down to about 150 meters. Now, if you were standing here and looking at that area, where would you put the boreholes? There's a paleo channel buried here. And I believe Imperial Oil knew that because it just came out too perfectly, and we'll see it in a second. But if not knowing that, where do we drill? How many holes are we going to put down to characterize the paleo channel? 
As I say, advancements in technology, airborne technology can now map from the very near surface, the top 5, 10, 20 meters, down to depths of up to 500 meters or a little bit more. But, um, but yeah, near surface and depth. So here, we're looking at the top few meters. As we're slicing down through the Earth, we're now at 15 meters. Things are becoming more conductive. I haven't explained the color bar, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, high resistivity of the red colors and, and conductivity is in blue. We're seeing how conductive it's getting. Uh, we're now at 70 meters, and look at the feature. Uh, so in, in our interpretation, yes, we're looking at, at, at the resistivity values, but we can also tell something about the shape here. This definitely looks like a buried channel. We're down at 100 meters, and uh, uh, now we're at 150 meters, and this is where we started to lose the signal once we got down about that depth. This is with a, a system that, that SkyTem had uh, four years ago, and we could see it about 350 meters at that time. So... Um, Again, the, the point here is if you, I shouldn't say it's like battleship, but you know, is it a hit or a miss if you were putting down boreholes? And uh, so a very large area, that's the thing about airborne geophysics. You can cover a very large area very quickly, very economically. To fly this area for Imperial Oil was two and a half days to collect all, all of that data. Also, now Imperial knows, or if they wanted to, to um, see where that, is, is, is where's it water coming from, where's it going to? Uh, and if you had to go off this grid and drill boreholes, well, you could lose that paleo channel quickly. We can see how it's, uh, it's, so airborne geophysics, again, giving the big picture quickly. Same survey, Horn River Basin, uh, one of the geoscience uh, BC partners here is EOG Resources. And we were, I was working with uh, Denny Dufresne, a geophysicist in Calgary on this. On the left, we see a, um, a satellite image showing an Esker system. And on the right, we see the airborne data. And we can see, before we were looking at 150 meters, well, same data, same flights, uh, different property. Look at the, uh, on the right-hand side, the resistivity data. We're lo looking at the top three to five meters. And we can certainly see some correlation there between the airborne geophysics, the EM data, and, and, the, uh, and the satellite data. What Denis and EOG were interested in here was the, the, the resistivity, the small resistivity, uh, the, the blue-green on, on the resistivity. And that is um, sand and gravel deposits. They needed to find construction materials to build roads and drill pads. And um, they went ahead and drilled some of those areas the winter after we flew the survey, and indeed they did find sand and gravel deposits. But for groundwater, this could also potentially mean areas for, for groundwater recharge. This would be the least path of resistance for water to enter uh, into the ground. So, um, and again, covering a large area quickly. The same, uh, this is EOG resources again. I don't know if anyone is here from Mira Geosciences, but this is from... Uh, I have. Scott Napier was the author uh, on a paper that was given at the Geo Convention last year in, in Calgary. I was a co-author on that paper. This is an image from the paper that, that Scott wrote. The blue, green, red is the EM data. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I don't have a pointer. I don't need one. There's two screens. It wouldn't do me much good anyway. But you can see the black lines there. I hope you can. That's seismic data. That was, that was Seismic was shot before the airborne data. So now we're correlating data sets. And we can see that the, there's close correlation between the seismic data and, and the airborne data. In the top, we're looking at the weathered layer. Just below that, we see a clay barrier. Um, and then down to the bedrock, the airborne did not penetrate as deeply. And I hope you can see that scale there, but it's exaggerated. We're looking at about 140 meters depth over an area of about one and a half kilometers. So what was interesting here to EOG was there's a, you can see an artesian well, that figure of the, the well. And we can see why the water, why the artesian well exists there. Uh, you can see the clay as we're, uh, as we're going down, downgrading toward the north, and the water is being pinched out between the clay aquitard above and the bedrock and wet sand below. So that water is under pressure and being forced to the surface. What was interesting to EOG and um, recently other companies that I'm speaking to in, in Calgary is that um, this could be, instead of water, and an artesian well, it could be gas, and it could present a drilling hazard. So, um, uh, or if you had a SAG-D operation, you want to know that you've got a clay aquitard there to avoid blowout. So there's a number of differences from the same data set, near surface, deep, and different things you can interpret for. Uh, of course, it's important to collect good data, and, and always, if you've got any a priori data, as I said, boreholes, any other information, seismic, 
and to incorporate all of that together to do a, a good interpretation. We're going to go south now, the Ogallala Aquifer in Nebraska. I will come back to Geoscience BC and the Peace Project in, in just a minute. About the same time that Geoscience BC was evaluating airborne geophysics for, for mapping groundwater, the United States Geological Survey was doing the same thing in the USA. They started with an area in Nebraska, a large agricultural state. Um, not sure why they picked the area they did, but um, it was a test area. And, and instead of, rather than just testing the applicability of airborne geophysics, they knew that airborne could map water, but um, they wanted to see which technology was the best at mapping water. And, and over the space of about two years, they flew fixed wing, uh, helicopter, time domain, frequency domain, a number of different technologies, evaluated them all, and uh, I'm very happy to say that, that SkyTem uh, came out on, on top of that. We continue to fly for the U.S. As a matter of fact, we flew earlier this year in California, and uh, we haven't left the state since. Um, so that was back in 2010 when the tests were done. So Nebraska um, said, well, we need to do more of this airborne geophysics. It's really good at mapping aquifers. I'm going to let um, PBS, um, Quest program did uh, a program, a video on, on uh, airborne geophysics for mapping water. It's a seven minute video. It's available on the SkyTime website. Speaking of websites, I'm sorry I didn't mention, but going back to the Horn River Basin, all of that data I showed you and more is available on the Geoscience uh, BC website. And uh, since we've acquired all of that data, it has been advanced process, so there's, there's even more detail available than, than what I've shown you. So I'm going to, um, Jimmy, do I start that or? Thanks. This is just the f last few seconds of a seven minute video. Make a map of where everything is. Each sky tent signal acts as a virtual borehole that displays sediments in vivid colors. For geologists, blue and green mark water resistant silts and clays, while yellow and red reveal the sands and gravels that make oh, up aquifers. I can't see the image when below it's all is done, there any way You will to, look uh, at a picture okay. sideways through that map you will be able to see what geologists always want to see. We want to know what's real. We want to know where our imagination is and where the reality is. The important part is, is when we're mapping, we know the difference between where we have aquifer material and where we don't. Terrific, thanks, Jimmy. Um, that voice is uh, Mr. Jim Canny. He was yours at the United States Geological Survey. He left and joined a consulting firm called XRI. This is uh, one page of the report that, that Jim did from a very large report, several hundred pages that was done on, on, that, on this particular survey. We can see the, uh, the airborne data up in the left-hand corner. There's a red line, hard to see, I know, but below that it shows the EM data. There are holes in that data because of power lines, uh, roads, and infrastructure that's uh, on the surface uh, that we couldn't interpret under. But they took the resistivity values, they took a priori information of, of what they knew about the area, and, and, uh, and did an interpretation of the geology. Uh, more than this, though, they took it a step further and created this lovely 3D image. As we heard in the video, the Quest video, the red yellow areas are um, uh, the materials where you would, th that are, form the aquifers. These are the coarse sand and gravels and uh, just being a little bit more conductive than the, um, uh, sorry, resistive than the, uh, than the surrounding uh, rock. So like we did for Imperial Oil, I'm gonna take now slices off of the, uh, the top. We're gonna um, go down into the earth at 150 meters and down to, uh, this time, 250 meters. And again, the, the red areas, this is where you would drill four aquifers. You can see it overlaying on top of the bedrock. It's uh, quite a nice image that, that, uh, that XRI did. Nebraska did not stop there. This was from the report, but what the NRD in Nebraska has done, this is available on their website, and it's an interactive video. When you click on it, it takes you to a Google Earth image. And um, this is just a, a a snapshot of that image. Uh, don't have a pointer, but I think it's easy enough to say that. As When you get to this on Google Earth, you 
hover your mouse over the areas, the blue white areas, and you get those pop-ups. I've just put two here. So the dark blue areas, that shows you the thickness of, um, of the aquifer, the depth to the top. So now we know how far down that aquifer is. We know how thick that aquifer is. They've gone so far as to calculate how many trillion gallons of water are underneath. Um, and we can see areas that are shallow. So th they put down monitoring wells and they can now see the, the rise and fall of the aquifer for the agricultural uh, district. Correlation with boreholes, the top figure is uh, from Geoscience Australia. This report came out about a month ago. We can see close correlation with the boreholes. The numbers under the boreholes, I don't expect you to read those, but what that is is distance away from the flight line. So that might explain why some of the correlation is not as tight, but generally it's very close. The red areas are the aquifer materials. Geoscience Australia said before they flew the airborne, they were successful on less than 20% of the boreholes that they drilled. And now with the airborne, they are better than 50% and improving all the time as they're getting more information, reinterpreting the airborne data, tightening, tightening up some of the calculations. Uh, they're getting even better with their boreholes. The image below is um, very near surface. This is, um, it, it, it's not water example, but I just wanted to, to show the correlation with, with boreholes to uh, a mine in Panama. They are building infrastructure. It's now going to be an operating mine. So they wanted to find where the bedrock was at or near the surface so it would support um, heavy uh, equipment. And we can see the close correlation here between the, uh, the airborne and the, and the drills. Closer to home, um, and more recently, the Peace Project. You can see the rectangle here, it was shown earlier, um, 8,000 square kilometers. In airborne geophysical terms, we flew 21,000 line kilometers in 43 days. Quite proud of that as well. This is the um, just very preliminary data here. You can, the objectives we've already talked about, just combine the airborne with other data to get a better understanding of the aquifers. The original rectangle up in the top northeast corner, you can see an additional area there. Geoscience BC worked very closely with the First Nations people in the area. And as the survey progressed, some of them decided they would join. The area up in the northeast corner is the Blueberry First Nations added an area. And I apologize, I've cut off in the bottom northeast. You can just see it on the, on the right-hand side. The Doig River First Nations added some properties there and came on board. And um, uh, we can see here, this is some of the community involvement. We landed the system. People had an opportunity to come out, ask questions, and just kick the tires on the system. Engineered specifically to map aquifers, not all systems are the same. Um, and SkyTem, ju just to make you aware that work we've done around the world, the top left-hand corner, this is Antarctica two years ago. The National Science Foundation used uh, airborne geophysics to map sea ice thickness. On the top right, this is India, much like the USGS and, and Geoscience BC had done. They tested in six areas the applicability of airborne geophysics. They're now talking about mapping the entire country of India. Uh, bottom right is, it's hard to see, but there's a helicopter and a system in there mapping in Mount St. Helens, the USGS using it to map water under, under the volcano. And our, our founder, our CEO, board of directors, and, and head Viking in, in Denmark, uh, Kurt Sorensen on a Galapagos Island. I was surprised, disappointed to hear that on a Galapagos Island, people leave plastic water bottles behind. So um, the Darwin Foundation, the French government, and others got together and to see if we could map groundwater on this Galapagos Island, and indeed we did. So next, well, who knows? Um, could be... Uh, <laughs> No, but don't laugh. Fifteen years ago, I was with Fugro. We worked up in the Houghton Crater with NASA. They were talking about this back then. Now, I don't think we're going to you know, get conventional airborne systems up there, but, but who knows? We'll, we'll see. And I couldn't help it, but yeah, um, I'll leave you with that, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>